But also we're going to try our hand at the seventh parakets at Solim. And we begin with the Pasuk in Parshas Bo. And the Pasuk says, Al tochlu mimenu no uvashel mevushal bamayim ki im tzli eish. And then the Torah describes the tzli eish, exactly how we roast the carbon Pesach. It has to be roasted over a fire. And the Pasuk says, Rosho al kroav vi al kirbo. So we're talking about kroav and kirbo. Kroav are the lower parts of the legs. And kirbo are what we call the bnei me'ayim. We call it in Yiddish the kishkes. Now these have to be situated in a certain way. The Torah doesn't exactly specify exactly how. And we're going to see now a machlok stream, Rabbi Yossi Aglili and Rabbi Akiva about exactly how you do this roasting. And I suspect that there are two issues here. One issue is where to put the Krav and Kirbo, meaning the Krav and the Bnei Me'ayin. Is it on the inside or you take it outside? I mean, obviously the Torah is concentrating its attention on Krav and Kirbo. It doesn't just say roast the carbon Pesach. So there's something about Rocho al Krav al Kirbo. So that has to be understood. The second issue, I think, is Tzli itself. Because Tzli means a direct relationship between the fire and the and the lamb in this case, without any liquid medium. Once you have a liquid medium, then you're talking about Bishel. And the Torah says, Al tochlum menu bashel. So let's take a look at the Mishnah. Ketzad solin es ha Pesach. So we're talking about Sliyas HaPesach. And that's going to happen. The Gemara says earlier, if let's say the 14th of Nisan is on Shabbos, so Sliyas HaPesach is not Doche Shabbos. And we're going to differentiate between what's called Asiyas HaKarbon, which is Doche Shabbos, and Sliyas HaPesach. So now, once the previous parak has established the concept of Tzliyas HaPesach as a separate entity, separate from the Asiyas HaKarbon, now the Mishnah wants to know Ketzad. Exactly how do you, how do you roast the Pesach? So we start with Rabbi Yossi Aglil. Mivim Shapud, and the English translation of Shapud is a spit. We know this from Yoridea, all the laws of Heksha Kalim and Hayyamach Shirakli that is used in direct connection with the H. It doesn't have a medium of water. Now, this Shapud, the Mishnah says, is Shel Rimon. And there are many different trees. The Mishnah somehow chose a pomegranate tree. So there must be something about the material and the nature of the wood of a pomegranate tree that makes it unique. And that's what the Gemara is going to try to understand. 
Okay, but the main question is, where do we place the Krav and the Kirbo or the Bnei Me'o? So Tochavo Litoch Piv Ad Beis Nekuvaso in no sense as krav as pnei meav l'socho divrei Rab Yosi Aglili. Now, what we have to know is that there's a halacha called hadacha. In order to fulfill the myth of hadacha, so the kirbayim and the krav have to be have to be rinsed properly. And in order to do that, to achieve that, you have to take it out of the karma, out of the lamb. And now, for tzliya purposes, Rabbi Yossi says you have to put it back into the lamb. And we'll see that Rabbi Akiva is going to have a problem with that. So the, the spit is going to hold on to the lamb over the fire, and the fire is going to directly roast the lamb. So the spit is to be placed in a way that the entire lamb is stretched over the fire, all held up by the sheep, by the chapud. And we've got to put the Kirayim and the Bnei Me'ayim back inside the lamb so that that part of the carbon becomes roasted, becomes salud. What's Rabbi Akiva's problem? Rabbi Akiva Omer, Kimin Bishal, who said that when you put the the Kra'av and the Bnei Me'ayim back into the lamb itself, into the belly of the lamb, it becomes like Bishal. Now, why does it become like Bishul? Because apparently, if I understand correctly, there are a lot of liquids inside these parts of the animal so that the liquids will get heated up and they will participate in the process of roasting the innards of the carbon. And then once you have liquids, you've got a problem because then it becomes Bishul. The language is kimin bishul. And I guess what that means is that it's not real bishul because it's being roasted over the fire. Maybe you could say there's a combination of A plus B. There are two elements here in the equation, and it's ke'en bishul. So therefore, Rabbi Akiva has to find another way of avoiding all the, you know, all the, in a sense, the, the lamb itself becomes like a sack, almost like a pot, holding on to the liquids that drip. So the fire goes from the bottom and it, it, it hits the liquids as well. What you're going to have to do is you're going to have to take these segments, these parts of the body of the lamb outside, which already we've done, but I mean to say we're not going to re replace them. We're going to have to somehow tie them down to the sheephood in a way that the fire will burn them and roast them directly. I'll just read to you the Me'iri here. He says, after they shechted the lamb, also they would cut it up. The chotech krov, the gamotzi espenei ameiayim umadichim im hakirayim. So it was hadocha. And Korea Bitno, they cut the stomach, they took out the crove, and then they cleaned it of tsoa and, and perish, different kinds of uh, 
of filth that had to be removed. And this is based on a pasuk that says, At the very beginning of Sefer Vayikra. So that halacha of Hadacha applies to Pesach no less than it does to all karbonis. It's not a specific requirement in Pesach. Now, he also quotes here other commentaries that say we have to be very careful when we remove, especially the Kra'ayim, that we don't break any bones because the Torah says we had some low sitchburubo. So he's only going to take it out in a way that he cuts the Gidim in order to remove it. And that's not called Shviras Etzim because that's Gidim. Fine. Now, the interpretation of Yossi Aglili, if we go back for a moment, seems to reflect the fact that the Torah requires sli uloki echad. Now, he points out that Rashi on the Torah itself emphasizes in that parish in Bo that soleu kulo ki echad. So when the Torah mentions krav and kirbo, it's all kulo ki echad. So if we remove these parts from the lamb, then in a sense, according to Rabbi Yosef Glili at least, we are now doing tzli, not kulo ki echad, but there's a tzli on the karayim, and there's a tzli on the bnei meayim, and there's also a tzli on the, the goof of the of the set. So the best way, according to Yosef Lili, of achieving kulo ki echad, which the Torah requires, is by putting everything back inside the lamb, and then we consider it as echad. And then we get to Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva is worried about Ke'en Bishul. He says, Ein ze Bishul Mamish. Even Rabbi Akiva agrees that this is not Bishul, but it's somewhere between Bishul and Sli. So, Bosar Misbashel Betoch Kedera Bishumnin Chalo. In other words, the natural oils that are in the meat itself without adding any water, now become like a substitute in place of water. And now there's Bishal in those Shumanim, in those oils of the animal. And this is called Sli Kedar. And there's a machlokas between the Chachamim and Rebbe about the status of Sli Kedar. That's a sugi back on Daf Mem Aleph. Is it called Sliesh or is it not called Sliesh? So these are the liquids, the noslim, that are the natural noslim of the of the Basar Karma. And now he quotes the Achronim, the Tzvas Emes and the Tzlach, who claim that Rabbi Akiva objects to Rabbi Yosef Glili only Mir Abbanon because of Nirekim of Asher. In other words, Rabbi Akiva accepts the sheet of the Chachamim that Sli Kedar is not called Bishal, it's Sli. But Mir Abbanon, it looks like Sli. I'm sorry, it looks like Bishal. So that's what he means when he says Kimin Bishal, who said. I mean, that puts the whole mission in a different perspective. If you, expect, if you accept that, then Rabbi Akiva is not trying to interpret the Pasuk in Chumash. He could accept Rabbi Yosef that you need to be Tzola Kulo Ki Echad. And therefore, we should return after the Adacha these parts into the Lamb. But it's worried about it, Rabbanon, that it looks like Misha. You know, this has to do with the fact that as opposed to the Asiyah Sakarba, which is done in the Migdash, 
Li is done in the home of every single Chabura who's ever hosting the Chabura. And if they're going to mistakenly think that something that looks like Bishal is really Bishal, then another year they might come to actually be Mabashal the Korban Pesach. Otherwise, we might apply the principle of Ein Shavus the Mignosh. But we're not talking about in the Mignosh, we're talking about Sli, that is a process that's undergone outside the Mignosh. So what does Rabbi Akiva advocate? He says, El Etolin Chutzalo which means that we take the Kra'av and the B'nei Me'ayim and they put it outside the lamb itself. So you remember we said that the lamb has to be, I'm sorry, the shapud, the spit has to be inserted from the back of the animal, the nekavav, all the way to the piv, to the mouth. So there's going to be part of the shapud that's going to protrude beyond the mouth of the lamb, and that's where we're going to place the kirayim. So the, the shiput goes through the lamb, and then through the kirayim, and through the bnei me'ayim, and all this is a long spit that's over the fire. No one could mis mistakenly confuse this with bishul, because the the liquids will, any shumanim of the, of the animal will be burnt up immediately by the fire. They won't collect inside the animal. Now the Mishnah goes on and says, Ein tzolonis pesach lo al hashapud. Now, we said before that we use a shapud shel rimon, a general shapud, if you don't add any description is made of metal because metal is not going to burn whereas wood will burn and we're not going to allow using a shaput now the reason why this is so is because part of the spit as we said protrudes outside of the carbon pesach, outside of the lamb. And what's going to happen is that if it's a shapud, meaning of metal, that part that's outside the lamb will immediately heat up because of the fire. And that heat, because metal is a conductor of heat, is going to go what's called ham mixoso ham kulo, and what's going to happen is, is that the inside of the lamb is going to be the first to be roasted by the heat of the shiput. So that's what's called mechamem eschela kapnimi benitzle hapesach mechom hashiput shebetocha. See, the problem is that we need the fire to roast the pesach, not the shiput. And if the shiput, or the shaput, as they pronounce it, is now heating up, we'll use the word cooking, the inside of the lamb, then that's not called tzli. Tzli has to be a direct relation between the H and the basar of the carbon. And that's called tzli H. Velo ala askala. So the askel is a little bit different than the shapud because the askel is also made of metal, but as opposed to being inserted into the animal and hold the animal over the fire, that's a shapud, the askel is metal that holds up the, the basar of the karma. And once again, what happens is as soon as the fire hits the askel and heats up the metal, that metal will in turn begin to cook the lamb. So it's the metal that's cooking the lamb, not the fire. So it's not Sli H. So I'm going to borrow an English term. I don't know if it's exactly the translation of Askala, but it'll get a point, I, just to get a point, uh, get across the point, we'll call it a grill, a metal grill. 
and that's where the heat of the ash goes in direct contact with this metal grill. Amar Rabbi Tzadok, Maisa Biram Gamliel, Shomer Litovi Avdo, Tsei Utsleilanu Es HaPesach Al HaAskala. So we see that Rabbi Tzadok was not in agreement with the Mishnah, as we have it, that disqualifies Askala. And the Gemara is going to have to reinterpret this because Askala is certainly excluded. So the Gemara is going to talk about different types of Askalas. One has holes in it, one is solid. Anyway, we'll get to that in Mirza Hashem later on in the parrot. So the Gemara asks the following, why does the Mishnah disqualify a shapud that's made of metal? Again, we haven't yet gotten to the point where we want to ask why the wood, the wooden spit has to be from a pomegranate tree. So the answer is, and therefore, the heat on one end of the shipud, which is protruding and is directly in contact with the fire, is going to be conducted throughout the entire shipud. Become mitve machmasa shipud. And komitve is the Aramaic word for tzli. So that's going to come up a lot. And the tzli now is a result of the shapud of this metal spit that was heated up, but not as a result of the H. Rachmana Omai, the Torah says, Sli H. Velo Tzli Machmas Tovar Achim. So the Gemara says, Venaise Shel Dekel. So wood is not a conductor of heat. And if the wood is, the, the spit is made of wood and it's holding up the Karbesach, then the H will do its job and directly roast the carbon Pesach. But why? A pomegranate. Why not take a day tree, a palm tree? So Mara says, I did the Isle Shibe, the palm tree has, he calls it Shuros, Shuros Shel Haritzim. It means that the palm tree in its natural state is not smooth. The, 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 the branches of, of, of the palm tree are not smooth, but they're full of crevices. They're full of um, indentations. And that's where the liquids, the sap of the palm tree collect in those crevices. And that's what he calls mapic maya. When he puts the branch, the wood of a day tree over the fire because the collection of the sap is in the charitzim, then it's going to heat up these liquids, and then it's as if the Pesach was cooked, because at that point of contact between these shibe or charitzim in Hebrew, and the fire of the carbon Pesach, we have certain segments of the lamb itself that are in direct contact with the shive, with these haritzim, so that the fire is going to hit these liquids. And at least in those points of contact between the carbon pesach and the shive, that's where it's going to be mavuchal. It's going to be cooked by the liquids that collect in the shive. And now we can begin to appreciate the pomegranate tree. Ah, before we get to the pomegranate tree, apparently there's another tree who, besides the pomegranate tree, that doesn't have shibe. And that's Menese Shel Te'ena, a fig tree. I should actually do a, an experiment. We have a fig tree out here. Anyway, he says a fig tree, if you make a shiput out of a fig tree, 
then it doesn't have shibi. So there's no collection of liquids and there's no point of contact with the carbon pesach, which is kimavushal. The Gemara rejects the ena as well for a different reason. Id the mechalchel mapik maya v'habili kimavushal. And in the Hebrew translation here, I didn't get a chance to look in the English translation, but he says, Hurach, in other words, it's still moist, it's not dry, and therefore, Yesh Bitocho Moach, it has a certain sap inside of it. And once again, that liquid is going to cause Bishal in those points of contact between the Esh and where the Shiput is holding on to these to these soft parts of the Te'ena. Next, Venesi shall alone. Alone, to my knowledge, is an oak tree. Let me just see if by chance I'm right. Yes, I got it right. An oak tree. Alone. Shel Charuv, a carob tree, that much we know. The Shel Shikma is a sycamore tree, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. And these are all very hard wood. There's no moisture, no sap. It's not liquidy and soft. So Gemara says that with these other trees, the wood has a different problem. And that is how to smoothen out the wood. I the de ispe kitre. He says, Yeshbem Ksharim, there are knots, so to speak, natural knots in the wood. And they protrude. And he's got to cut them down in order to soften, I'm sorry, in order to smoothen the surface of the shapud, because otherwise. If there are protrusions, then when you use the shapud and penetrate it into the into the um, meat, it's not going to do a good job. It's going to get caught. So we want to get rid of that. So we smoothen it out. And mapik maya, even though the tree itself, the, the wood is relatively hard, but there's still liquid in it. And when you have to chip it down with a knife in order to smoothen it, we used to do this as kids. Do you remember this? You know, you take a piece of wood and you and you cut it down with a knife and then you make a sharp end down and you make your own arrows out of it. He says at that point, mapik maya, the water will come out. So the Gemara asks immediately, shall rimo nami ispe kitre? So the Gemara is assuming two pluses, but one minus in the case of a pomegranate tree. Number one, it doesn't have shibi doesn't have those charitzim where the liquids accumulate. In that sense, it's like peena, like a fig tree. Number two, it doesn't have the drawback of a fig tree because a fig tree is wood that's very soft and moist. On the contrary, Shal Rimon fits into the category of alon, charuv, and shikma. But what are we going to do with the problem of the kshorim, of the knots that have to be cut down? And that's going to cause the liquids to come out. So Gmari Ashal Rimon Nami Ispe Kitri, it also has the same phenomenon that we saw in the sycamore, the oak tree, and the uh, carob tree. It has kshorim. So the Gmari answer is Shie Kitri. The pomegranate tree has a different type of kesher on it. The kshorim are smooth. Shia means smooth. And therefore, even in its natural state where it's dry, you can use it as a shipud and those kshorim will not will not interfere. They won't be ma'akev when you insert the shipud. So he doesn't have to take the knife and cut down these knots because the knots are very smooth. It could be, I don't know, that maybe what the Gemara means by smooth is that it's on the surface level. It doesn't protrude. 
right? The problem of the ikuv of these ksharim of kitri is when it's protruding, so you don't have the flat surface of the wood. Ibois emo. Another possibility as to what the Mishnah has in mind by a shiput of Rimon is binavga bar shata. So bar shata means it's only one year old. The lespe kitre. I mean, I have to figure out what about the alone, the charuv, and the shikma. What about if they were one year old? Do they have kshorim? I don't know. We'll have to figure that out. But at least as far as the Rimon is concerned, if you cut down the cut out the branches of the Ramon tree within the first year, and keep in mind there's no Easter Arla on the wood itself. The Easter Arla is only an Easter Arla on the payros. We don't have any Ramonim now on the tree. It's a brand new, what's called in Hebrew, Nitia. You know, you just planted it. And if it's in the first year, and there are no ksharn, there are no knots whatsoever. So you don't have to bother with a knife and cut down the knots in order to smoothen the surface of the shapur. Okay. So now I want to read to you a note in which he quotes the Sfasemis. L'chore kosha. Me'achar shemamidu minetiyo bashno, so according to the second lishna, Oh, so we're on the right track. He's not sure about it. I guess we have to ask a botanist, an expert. But he thinks that what the Gemara has in mind is that with regard to the other trees, they immediately produce these sharim, uh, even, even when they're very young saplings. So the Gemara now asks the following question: What Ika Bay Piske? In other words, when you take a a branch off a tree, you have to cut it at some point in order to make it into a chipud. So the point where you cut it, which is called bay piske, piske is where you cut it off, there's going to be some liquids that are going to come out of the branch of the wood itself at that point when you cut it down. And that's going to cause a bishol of the carbon pesat. So Gemara answers, demapik lebe piske lebar. That that, the top part of the shapud, which has the liquid in it, as a result of the incision, that's going to be outside of the fire. So when you penetrate it through the lamb, the head part of the shapud is outside the fire. So the fire never, come in contact, never comes in contact at all with those liquids that exude as a result of the uh, surgery of when you cut it down. Masnison de Lok Rabbi Yehuda. We're going to learn now a brisa. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Kishem Sheshapud Shal Eitz Eno Nisraf, Kach now, Rabbi Yehuda, at the face of it, seems to reject the entire principle of Cham Miktsaso Cham Kula. We say that Mateches has to be excluded because once part of the Mateches is hot, the metal conducts the heat and the entire Mateches is hot from tip to toe, and that's going to Cause the cooking of the carbon pesach, so it's not sleep. Amru lo, so the chacham turned to Rabbi Yehuda and say, "How can you accept and validate a shapud shel mateches for the carbon pesach? Is zeh hamik tzosom ham kulo? V'zeh hamik tzosom yeno ham kulo? You have no right to equate." 
a shapud that's made of wood with a shapud that's made of metal. To the same extent, you, you cannot claim that to the same extent that the shapud of eights of, of wood does not does not con conduct the heat, so to the shapud of metal does not conduct heat. That's not true. Metal conducts heat. But it seems from our Gemara that Rabbi Yehuda, despite the objection of the Chacham and their argument against him, he still maintained his original position. Hence, the Gemara derives the conclusion that our Mishnah, excluding a Shapur of Mateches, is against Rabbi Yehuda. Now, how would Rabbi Yehuda defend himself against this principle of Cham Miktos Cham Kulo? I, I'm guessing that he holds that Cham Miktos Cham Kulo is a process. It doesn't happen immediately. So that if there's a, a fire underneath the carbon, that fire is going to burn the Basar Hapnimi, not just the Basar Hapnimi, before the Cham Miktos Cham Kulo kicks in. So we don't have to be worried about Cham Miktos Cham Kulo. It could be that Rabbi Yehuda would even advocate and prefer to use a, a regular shapud because in the case of wood, the wood itself might burn. We don't want that to happen. Again, the wood is, is not likely to burn because what's happening is the fire is in direct contact with the flesh of the lamb. It's not in contact with the, sheep, the shapud. But nevertheless, certainly metal is an is an easier way of making a, a spit and, and roasting. Let me just see if by chance in a million he has any note on this. No, he has no note. Don't know why, why we don't find any apparently any achronim that try to defend Rabbi Yehuda. Now the Mishnah says, V'nosein es kro'av, es b'nei me'av l'solcho, di Rabbi Yosag, li Rabbi Kiva Omer, kemin bichel uze, ele tolen achutza, tolen chutza lo. Tanya, we learned to the Bryce, Rabbi Shmuel, Koreu, he had a nickname for the process of roasting the carbon pestle. He called it toch toch. Toch toch is throughout Chazal, is a phrase that describes bichel. When the, when the water boils and you hear the cooking, it sounds like poch tok. So the question is, we're talking about sli, we're not talking about bichel. Apparently, Rabbi Shmuel accepts the shita of Rabbi Yossi Aglili, which means that the natural juices or liquids or oils of the Bnei Me'ayim are inside the carbon and they are now coming out of the Bnei Me'ayim. And you could actually put your ear to the to the tle, to the lamb, and you'll hear the toch toch. You know, there's like bubbling and boiling of these liquids. But nevertheless, that's not called Bishal because as we said before, the natural uh, liquids inside the animal is not what really roasts the bosar. It's the roasting as a, re as a result of the age. And therefore, it's still considered sleep. That's the sheet of Rabbi Yosef Lili, and it seems that Rabbi Yishmael adopts that sheet. Now, there's another girsa which is quoted here by Rashi, called the Sfarim Yishonim, some old text. And it says, Rabbi Shmuel Koreu Tachbar. Tachbar is a combination of two words, toch and bar, inside and outside. Klomar, Mimula Mibifnim. There's the inside and the outside. And the carbon pesach itself is, is filled in the, in the middle. 
with the uh, Kirayim and the, and the Bnei Meir. So on the outside, all we see is the lamb. We don't see the kishkis, but they're on the inside. And that's called toch ubar. Tach bar. And once again, that proves that Rabbi Shmuel accepts the sheet of Rabbi Yossi Agri. Rabbi Tarfon Koreu Gdi Mekulos. Now that's a little bit complicated. Mekulos has to do with the armor that's worn on top of the, of the soldier. And it, it's made of copper. It's a very hard helmet, if you will, that the soldiers used to wear. What, what is this all about? So this has to do with Rabbi Akiva, because Rabbi Akiva says that we take the Kra'ayim and the Bnei Me'ayim, and we already removed, but I mean, say they remain outside the Karman. And we attach them with the shipud as it penetrates through the mouth of the lamb and into these parts. So he wanted to point out that when the kirayim and the bnei me'ayim start burning, it's like a helmet on top of the lamb, even though it's horizontal and not vertical. Now, why why does he call it? Why does he call it nechoshes? In other words, mekulos is a, a kova of nechoshes. It's made of copper. And he says that once they place these parts on top of the, right, on top of the, uh, of the head, right? So, right, we said the mouth is on the top. That's where the head is. So it looks like a kova shel nechoshes. Now, why Nechoshes? The Pasuk in Goliath, in Shmuel al Perkutain, says, V'kova Nechoshes al Rocho. All right, so at least we know that the Gibore Chayel, you know, wore a, a helmet that was made of, of copper, of Nechoshes. And the Targum on that Pasuk of Goliath, so Kova Nechoshes al Rocho, says kulas. He actually calls it by this word kulas. Kulas de nechoshes al rosho. And Rashi says that krav tolelo chutzelo betzido kinose klizeno betzido. Again, it's a little bit of a stretch. He's saying that it's like you know, the lamb is holding on to its arm, you know, to its weapon. He says, Krav ubre meov tluyum michutzalo bitsido kishitzoleu umakulos lashon. Ah, we say makulos is the language of a, of a helmet. Rashi says makulos is the language of a gibar mizuyan. And he's a warrior that's well weaponed. You know, he's got his weapons. Ukli Zeno Tluyim Lobitsido, right? He's got his sword that's hanging on his armor on the side. The Raman has a different translation of the word Makulas. He says, Makulas is Vilashan Mehudar. Mehudar. So Gdi. Mekulas means it's mehudar. Now, why that indicates Rabbi Akiva as opposed to Rabbi Yosegluli, I don't know. Let's just see if he adds anything in the English translation. He says, a helmeted kid. I know he used the word kid here for a for a lamb, I would have called it a lamb. Okay, he calls it a kid. He says, Rabbi Tafrin holds it, Rabbi Akiva, that the legs and the entrails would be placed on the spit above the head of the animal. They resembled the helmet on the head of a warrior. But Rashi says that the organs were placed on the spit alongside 
He calls it the carcass, meaning the lamb itself, in a manner of a warrior who stores his equipment beside him. All right, so far, I still am not sure why the color is that is similar to a, I guess maybe before it, it turns, you know, darker, it be, it's a little bit like silvery in its color when it begins to roast. Now the Gemara embarks on a very interesting question. On the night of Pesach, after Churban Abayas, are we allowed to eat a Gdi Mekulas? In other words, can we prepare meat in the same way, according to Rabbi Akiva, that they prepared the Karban Pesach and then eat that meat? Now this has to do as you know, with the sugya of Nireke Kachim Achutz. It looks like he was preparing Kachim, which is going to be eaten outside the base of Migdash. Now, Bishleim, if it was a carbon Pesach, Migdash Kayam, and we did all the Asiyas carbon in the Migdash, now we take the, the lamb itself and we, we roast it and we eat it outside the base of Migdash. So there's no Easter of Kodshim Bachutz with regard to Karben Pesach. But if you were to be makdish something today and then prepare it with a roasting process and eat it, that's Kodshim Bachutz. You have more or less designated this as Kodshim. And it's interesting, even though there's no base on Mikdash, you can still be makdish something. It's Kol slow Kulo Ki Echa. Now, I think what he means by kulo ke'echad, because even Rabbi Akiva has to agree that the Karben Pesach requires kulo ke'echad, because it says, sli esh rosho al krav al kirbo, everything gets burnt, gets roasted at the same time. But nevertheless, it's a question of what you do with the innards. Do you attach it on the outside or you leave it on the inside? But it's all already always going to be kulo ke'echad. So that if you want to prepare lamb for Leila Seder, I'm getting hungry just thinking about it, then you better cut up the parts of the lamb before you roast them. Because if you roast the lamb whole, I remember my mother, may she rest in peace, used to, you remember this, the barbecues, the, ro the ro rotisserie, right? She would roast the chicken and she would put a spit through the chicken from one side to the other. And it would go around and around and it would be broiled. That was a special treat for us. But to do that with a lamb on Leila Pesach, I don't think we have any problem with the chicken, but with a lamb, we, we got an issue here because you're roasting the entire lamb kulo ke'echad, and that's exactly tzli of a carbon Pesach. And therefore, it's similar to a carbon Pesach, and when you eat it, it looks like you're eating kachim outside, outside of, well, actually, I shouldn't say outside of the Migdash, because we're talking about a carbon Pesach. Carbon Pesach has a bit of, of shlomim, and you can eat it anywhere in Yushalayim, but it looks like you're eating it outside Yushalayim. However, nechtach mimenu ever, if you want to eat the, you know, the goat's meat or the kid's meat, uh, the lamb's meat on, on Lela Pesach, it's a nice delicacy. So just make sure to cut off, you know, piece by piece, the avarim of, of the lamb and roast them in that way. Oh, nishlat mimenu eva. Wow. It sounds like you can really roast the entire lamb minus one eva. As long as you take one eva out and you roast it separately or you cook it separately, now you can go ahead and roast the entire balance of the lamb because you've already indicated that this is not sliyas apesa. Because Sliach HaSapesach requires Kulo Kiecha. Is Ein Zeh Gidima Kulos? So Gidima Kulos now takes on this definition that is Sliach Kulo Kiecha. And therefore, it's, um, it's not a problem. So Gemara says, Hashli Yesh Lomar. 
Nechtaf mimenu ever the afal gav de komifi lebade. Ah, now the Gemara wants to know. Let's say you sever one of the limbs of the lamb, and now you 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 um, roast it together with the rest of the lamb. Amrit lo. Just one second. In other words, the Brisa says that if it's nechtach mimenu ever, that's okay. Ein zegdi makula, makula. So the Gemara says that applies even in a case where he would do the tzlia of kulo kiecha. I don't get it because that only makes sense according to according to Rabbi Shmuel. Just one second. According to Rabbi Akiva. Anyway, let me just get the flow of the Gemara. Is Necha anyway? I forgot to come midfield late by day. Amrit low. It's not considered gedi makulas. Oh, is nishlak me boy? Why did the Brisa feel compelled to add nishlak? I mean, if there's any chiddush, it's in the case of what the Gemara calls mitve, meaning sleep. That even if you roast the entire lamb simul, you know, at one fell swoop, it's not called Gedim because you severed an Aver, how much more so if you cooked one of the Avarin? I mean, that's not even a Havami. So why did the Bryce have to go out of its way to mention Nishlak? Omar Av Sheshes Sheshlako Bimachubar He didn't sever that that aver. So, so imagine he's got a lamb, and what he does is he puts the lamb, so to speak, on the top of a pot, such that one part of the lamb dips into the water. The rest of the lamb is above. Right, the the kadera above the lip of the kadera, and now he can once the aver that's already submerged in the water cooks, he can now lift up the whole thing and do tzli on the entire lamb, and it's not called gedi makulos because one part of the one aver of the lamb was already mavusha, and that's called nishlak b'mechuba. Let's see if he adds anything. No. Let's just, I just want to focus. How are we doing on the clock? Just don't, all right, we still have five more minutes. I just wanted to focus on the Afal Gav of here. The Afal Gav, the called Mitve Le Bahade. He writes here, Afshu Tsola Esa Ever Chenichtach Yachad Im Shar Bosar Hagedi. Now, why is that not Gedi Mekulos? Oh, I got it. I'm sorry, I missed the point here. And the one who caught this was the Tzlach, the Tzil Nefesh Chai. I'd be totally lost in this sugi without him. He says that what does it mean in the Brisa that Nechtach Mimenu Ever ain't Zegdi Makulos? He means that he cuts an Ever other than the Kirayim or the Bnei Meil. So had it been a carbon Pesach and he cut this Ever off before the Tzli, that would not be the way that we roast the carbon pesach. Meaning, again, he, it's, the talk doesn't uh, sort of sp uh, speak this out, but I think what he's saying is that even if you hold like Rabbi Akiva, that the parts of the animal are outside and attached to the sh shibud, nevertheless, those are dafka, the bnei ayim and the karayim. 
those which the Torah specifically specifies in the Pasuk of Tzli, they will now get a direct hit, so to speak, from the fire, and they will be roasted. And therefore, Rabbi Akiva advocates that we take them out of the inner, inside of the lamb. But if you cut off a different aver and you place it on the outside of the lamb, that's already not the way that we would roast the carbon pesach. We only take out the kirayim and the and the bnei Me'ayim because the Torah specifies. Again, we go back to the pasuk one more time. It says, Ki im tzli eish rosh al krav al kirvo. Kirvo means the b'nei me'ayim. But if you take a different aver, that's not something that should be removed from the Karb Pesach. That should be roasted directly with, in its natural state, in, you know, connected wherever it is inside the Pesach. So the very moment that he cuts an aver, other than these avarim, even if he roasts that aver together with the balance of the carbon, it's already no longer um, gedima kulos, and it's not included in the Easter of nirakik ochel kodchen vakulos. Amar Rabba, haimul yosa, oh, this is fascinating, from both sides. For those who have learned Yoridea and the laws of Kashrus, you know, I don't have to tell you, that there's something called Malicha, the purpose of which is to get the Dam out. In the Karben Pesach, there was no Malicha. And the question is, are we going to derive from the Karben Pesach that Sli does not need Malicha? Okay? Again, <laughs> I'm, I'm just reminiscing back to my young days when my mother used to actually roast the livers. You remember this? I mean, the whole house used to smell. Don't uh, excuse the expression. And uh, and we didn't require malicha because we take the liver and cut it up and put it on a little, you know, like a grill, a mini grill, and roast it. And once we roasted it, all the dam went out, and there was no need for malicha. All this comes from our sugya of Tzli of Karben Pesach, because there was no Malicha on the Tzli of Karben Pesach. There couldn't be Malicha on the Tzli of Karben Pesach, as we'll see. But here's the question. What happens when you have meat inside of meat? That's called Mulyaisa. So you have the outer meat that comes in direct contact with the H, and then you put meat inside. That doesn't get direct contact with the H. So there's a roasting process, and the heat is going to cause the dam of the, we'll call it the pnimi, to go into the chitzoni. So now the outer layer of meat, so to speak, is now absorbing the dam from the inner layer of meat. So now the question is, if we want to avoid malicha by roasting meat, can we wrap one meat inside another meat? roast them together, and we don't need malicha. There's no worry and concern about the dam that goes from the inner basar to the outer basar. And, and believe me, tomorrow we're going to see that it works in both ways, actually. There's not only is there going to be dam traveling from the inner basar to the outer basar, there's going to be dam that goes from the outer basar into the inner basar. The advantage of the dam of the outer basar is that since it's in direct contact with the H, the dam flows in a downward motion rather than go up towards the mulyaisa, towards the pnim. But it's fascinating to me that all these laws of tzli, which apply the whole year round, are derived from one day and one night of the calendar year when the Karmesef was, was still alive and active because if we go like Reb Nosi Aglili, then the innards of the lamb remain inside the lamb when you turn on the fire. So we've got a mulyaisa situation. And there was no mulich. So what happens to the dam of the kishkis, of the kirayim and the b'nei me'ayim during this process of tzli? 
why don't we assume that the dam is now absorbed by the outer meat? And the answer is, that's not a problem. And you still don't have an issue. And that's going to be derived from Tliasa Pes. Okay, Rabbi Osai, this was an experiment. I didn't know what would happen. So far, my head is still above the fire. <laughs> I don't know if it's, it's good. If I, I put a lot of work into this. I mean, there's a lot of reality of Mitzius here that you have to get familiar with. But the next sugya is very fascinating. You know, to think that we're going to derive halafas in Sli, as far as Malika is concerned, from the carbon pestle. So Mulyaisa here in Raba is Basar Shalom Nimlach, Shemila Betocho Basar Acher, Shigam Hua Daim Lo Nimlach, Utslam Yachat. Says Raba Sharia, you're allowed to eat it. So there was no malicha, neither on the inner bosar nor on the outer bosar. Amalei Abaya, Abaya is going to say, Vakabola, Dama, doesn't it absorb the da? That means the bosar, the chitzon, is bolea now at the time of the tzliya, the dam from the, that's niflat from the bosar haprimi, which is inside of it. So Rabba is going to introduce now a very, very famous principle called Kibolo Kach Holta, which Mr. Hashem, Blinetta will see tomorrow. So let's just make a note of where we got to. We'll start tomorrow, Blinetta, with Omar Rabba, which is towards the bottom of Daf, Ayin Dalit, Ayin Dalit Omar Rabba. Okay, then? That's, that's what we have. Wishing you a great day.